Good work, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, we we need to remember that uh, John the Apostle said God is love. You know, I had to really break into some more love back in in California really hard at times. And um, I remember the Lord had me do this little exercise, and I was drinking little Perrier bottles out there. It's kind of my little thing. (laughs) It was fun. And and as I was drinking it, the Lord put this picture in mind. It's like you need to take a piece of tape, and you need to write the word love in big black, like uh, Sharpie pen letters and wrap it around that bottle. And every time you drink it, you need to look at it. And remember, you're receiving my love. And I'm like, well, that sounds ridiculous, but I'll do it. (laughs) So I drank this water bottle that had love written on it. And it was like God began to use that as I obeyed that little step of faith just to try it to really begin to fill me with love. And on that day, my my day completely changed when I got a hold of love and really helped myself to really believe it and receive it, not get it up here as much, but let that really sink down into my reality, down in the core of who I am. And I remember driving home from work, I was just so kind and compassionate, buying people stuff, <laughs> being all sweet, you know, forgiving and merciful. And uh, I remember I was going home and I saw the exit signs, and like, they didn't say this, but in my mind's eye, I saw it say, instead of like Cupertino, this exit four miles, and then Las Gatos five miles, it said, love four miles, love five miles. It's like, it doesn't matter what exit you take, you're going to exit into love as well. And so that really just kept reaffirming me. And sometimes these little exercises can really help, you know, because we got to fight this fight. You know, The enemy hates it, and the world is contrary to it. But God is all about it. And when you get the love of God, you get all the other fruit of the Holy Spirit. And uh, then you start just being fruitful by default. It's amazing. So praise the Lord. All right. So this morning... Um, we're going to talk about fasting, and uh, fasting is important to, to go for and understand, but you can't do it apart from a grid of identity and love, and that you're free in Christ. You really don't have to, although as you grow in the Lord and mature, you're going to want to. And I'm going to explain how those things move you to move into some of these realms, and they're available to you, uh, again, to open more power, open up more intimacy, open up more brokenness. Remember Paul said, for when I'm weak, I'm strong. That's a mystery to unlocking the power of God in your life even through fasting. So fasting is about being strong. It's really about becoming weak, letting the Spirit give you His strength. Okay. So before we do that, um, I'm going to take up tithes and offerings. This is 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 12. And God is able. We'll get over that. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, it's a little small. It's kind of a big text. Little section here. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. Do you believe that? How much grace? All grace. Isn't that awesome? Just park there for a while. So many times we make it about how much we read in the Bible versus how do we really read even the little that we read. <laughs> so God is able to make all grace abound to you. That's his will. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's crazy supply. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. That's the blessing on your life. And that's what it's going to produce. So in all occasions, you can be generous. We had pizza last night, and Josh is like, I can't wait to make more money so I can leave a huge dip. I really love to bless people with that. It's hard. God, you know, you provision for you, brother, so you can do that. It's a great heart. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So it's interesting, we talked about Cornelius last week and how he gave alms to the poor as part of his lifestyle even before he got saved. It was amazing. What a generous generous heart. Very charitable. But guess what happens when you give something to somebody? Have you ever thought about that? Not just the moment of thank you. Would you could you imagine what maybe happens at night when you've given somebody some food or something they, they couldn't have gotten them themselves and they're going to sleep at night and they're saying their bed comfort? 
and start thinking and thanking God for and who? You. Overflowing many expressions of thanks to God. So when you get blessed in the Lord, even financially, and you begin to bless others, that's going to come up with memorial before God as people receive blessings from your life. And of course, it's way beyond finance, but that's a part of it. For whatever reason, we can't do life down here without it. <laughs> so God wants us to know how to master that domain and to use it for his glory and be generous on all occasions. So let's go ahead and take an offering. Um, I'll put the basket here. If you have one, go ahead. A couple, like just some keys on tithes and offering. Tithe is, you don't have, you're not on any obligation to do that in the New Testament, but tithing is kind of a principle of the 10% of kind of your income. And usually what most people do, Rachel and I do this, is we give that 10% typically to where we're being fed spiritually. And that's just a good practice. So if you have multiple places, maybe you divide that up a little bit. So you can give to places where you're really receiving abundance and, and provision. Then offerings are just wherever you feel moved or led and have an abundance that you want to give more to, you can give anywhere. Um, so that'll help you. And as, as you do that, God really moves into your finance. Yeah, come on up and go ahead and do that. Also, throughout the week, you just want to give... Uh, there's an offering box in the back. You just uh, make checks out the Auburn House of Prayer. And, um, you're good. Hallelujah. All right. Praise the Lord. And as you guys do this, I want you to see God, have a faith for God moving on your financial side of your life. You need it. He knows you need it. Um, so just keep your eyes open and give Him the glory as He begins to give you things and be generous with that towards those He puts in your life. Hallelujah. Thank you. Bless you guys. Okay, we're going to pray. Why don't you stretch your hands forward and we're going to bless this offering in the presence of the Lord. Father, thank you so much for your provision in our life, Lord. You give seed to the sower, Lord, and um, then you give an abundant harvest. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for the seed representing here, Lord. I pray for that abundant harvest to come, so that in all things we can be a blessing to all of your people. Um, so thank you, Lord. I pray just a supernatural uh, miracles, Lord, over finance, Lord, where we need breakthrough, God, um, debt getting taken care of and all those different things, Lord. We just pray that that would happen. Lord, favor, favor, favor in, in uh, all jobs and everything. Lord, we thank you for the miracles you've already done in this house with the cars. Two new cars are already happening, Lord, just out of your goodness. So we thank you, Lord, um, for how you're moving upon these offerings. And we bless you. We give you all the glory. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, yeah, there's a second car that got given recently, just yet, like this week. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, Josh and Mary. I mean, <laughs> and it's amazing because Josh said, he's, he came up here to get in prayer and he saw the Lord give him a, a truck or something with a bow on it and a gift. And so he's like, okay, maybe I'll go make this happen. I was like, no, I'm going to make this happen. So he's like, when? And doesn't maybe hear right away. But then he keeps it in his heart and uh, asks again. And the Lord says, tomorrow. He's like, wow, okay. And so he gets up the next morning. He's like, Lord, is it coming? He's like, today. And later on that afternoon, they get this phone call. From Hosanna Home, or no, from uh, yeah, Hosanna Home, Harvest Evangelism, Rick Hagen. It's a total gift. I mean, it's a beautiful blue car out there. Chevy Impala. Man, we're gonna get some rims on there. We also not. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But that's the second car. I mean, that's crazy. But I know they're giving. They're generous. And before, maybe they had a bunch to give or whatever. They're just sowing, being faithful into the Lord. God sees it, and he blesses. And so that's really amazing. That's the second car. The other one was an uh, all-expense-paid car with uh, insurance and all that stuff given to Christian and Allison. They've been believing for a while. And so uh, this can happen. It can happen to you. God does this not just to, to show off, but to give you faith for your life. Oh, come on. Yeah, please. Sure. <laughs> wow. 
Amen. I'm so glad you shared that because that's really true, and we can miss that. These little things, they seem little, but that's huge. The $24 natural face. <laughs> My face feels amazing. The Lord knows, and he loves your face. So come on, this is amazing, all right? So this is how God moves, but I'm so glad you caught that because sometimes that happens. We just think, oh, cool, thanks a lot, and I appreciate you being so nice. And we miss that. Actually, this came to the Lord, <laughs> you know? And we go back and thank him. You know, ten lepers came and got healed, and only one of them or something came back to say thank you? Only one. He said, weren't there ten of you guys, like, all messed up, and you got healed, all of you, and only one comes to say thank you? So we want to keep a heart that's always attentive that these blessings are coming from the Lord and to give him praise and glory. Amen. That's great. So this week, we're continuing our, our series, if you will, on developing keys that strengthen our inner man. You know, we talked about change coming on the inside. You get changed on the inside, your outside will all take care of itself. And so we're developing inwardly as much as we're just growing in life and, and getting years to our life. We want to develop our inner man because that's who we really are. And so I'm just sharing some keys on how to allow that to accelerate a little bit in your life. We talked about the secret place last week, and that's the starting point. I started there on purpose because if you don't have a viable like secret place with God, and it's not about praying a lot, it's about relating a lot with God. It's about really getting the place where I find him. And that secret place, although it may start in a place where you carve out so you can get dedicated time, you're undistracted, you really make it work, you get with God, you get honest, you get raw, it can begin to translate into the secret place right here, wherever you go. And so the secret place is always with you. And that's amazing. But you can begin to sharpen that realm already in a dedicated space. And Jesus would drew lonely, to lonely places often uh, to seek God. So we want to remember his example and follow that. So make that a part of your life, a group of your life. So the next one I want to bring up is fasting. And fasting is something that I think I kind of call like the, I mean, it's probably a bad way to phrase it, but the ugly stepchild or something like this of like the spiritual discipline. <laughs> Everybody hates it. It's like you bring it up, they're like, that's work, religion, don't do it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hey, I, I, I've been burned on work so, and performance issues. I need healing and all that stuff. And I've experienced a lot of healing on it, but... Um, but I did find that I can't get around fasting because it's a good thing. If you have a jacked up motive on it, it can mess you up. <laughs> so don't do it. You're probably not ready for it. But if you've got your identity foundation strong and the love of God strong, fasting will be an incredible addition to your spiritual life. And it can really take you places. I think Chris had a word from the Holy Spirit last week or something where he said, uh, the Lord just hit him in the service. like, without fasting, you will not open certain doors in your life. You cannot go into certain places. So fasting is good, and I hope with this message that you begin to shift your paradigm from like fasting is an unusual thing that maybe I'll do once in a while think we're really rough into, hey, that might be an awesome discipline to really bring me close to the Lord and to really experience his power in my life. So we're going to get into this real quick. So a couple of things here, or actually about five things here real quick to open up. Fasting is a powerful weapon in our arsenal of spiritual growth and development. We just covered that right now. So I need you guys to really begin to say, is fasting even in my life? Do I even recognize that it could be something good, something wonderful? Uh, number two, fasting is not to hurt you, it's to empower you. If you're in your natural man only, it only hurts you. But if you have a spiritual vitality and a power operating inside your life, you'll say, the more I can deny my flesh and myself to allow the spirit to come forward, that's a good thing. That's a powerful thing. It's a wonderful thing because I am not my flesh only. I'm a spiritual being. Number three, fasting was practiced by the patriarchs. You go throughout the scriptures, you'll see it everywhere. The matriarchs, I'll mention them as well. Um, uh, with Esther, three days of fasting saved the entire nation. Just three days. Prophets, kings, Jesus himself, apostles, and New Testament believers. So it's all over. You can't really escape it, whether you do it or not. You can't escape the presence of fasting all through the biblical narrative. It's there. And it's a big open door for you to step into when you're ready. Another one, four. Fasting is not as hard as you think. A lot of people hear the word fasting and they're just like shut down already. <laughs> I used to. But there's many, actually many ways to fast. And you don't always have to make it like, okay, I'm going for 40 days on a water fast because I'm going to actually do a real fast and I'll be back. I mean, who can do that really? You can if God sets it up. You can. I know people who've done it. But um, <laughs> don't make it so hard to enter into. Fasting be as simple as like, I'm not going to watch maybe TV for a week. Or maybe I'm going to do a uh, um, fast my Facebook or something. Or Netflix, come on, good, yeah. And, what, and the reason why that's going to work, we're going to talk about that, is because it's setting you into a realm where things are different on your life right now, for a time, and you feel it. You feel it. That's a very spiritual side of that. The other side is you get practical time to actually focus on God a little more. Okay, and then finally here, fasting is not about works. It's a pathway to unlocking God's power in your life. 
That's what Jesus taught. So if I'm going to go to anybody to get the authority and break down on fasting, it will be Jesus. And he commended it. He said, yeah, it's good. He had a couple um, Pharisees and John disciples show up saying, why aren't your disciples fasting? And it seems like this is the one section of scripture we typically only hear about fasting. And Jesus said, well, how can they fast when the bridegroom is with them? And so we're like, okay, cool, I don't have to fast anymore. But that's not the whole thing. He says, and the bridegroom will be taken away, and in those days, then they will fast. And he drops a massive key of intimacy right there. It's not about fasting. It's about me. It's about intimacy. And when they're with me, that's everything. But when, they're, when I'm gone, it will be different. Although my spirit is coming, it will be different. And in those days, they'll fast to find me and get closer to me. Okay. So here's Jesus' teaching on fasting. We hit this last week on the secret place. Now here he is breaking down fasting. And notice how these two are operating so close together. These are like core gritty, like nitty gritty realms of faith building. Okay. We can go into knowledge and study and all those things that are good. But this is going to really, this is kind of the um, meat of, of development in my opinion. So Jesus hits these really well. So this is um, Matthew 6, 16 and 18. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. That's what they wanted, to be recognized for fasting. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Some points from that real quickly. One, Jesus didn't say if you fast. He says when you fast. Because the spiritual life will ultimately go there if you're really hungry for God, not just food. So you need to at some point in your life begin to create a grid for fasting. Does that mean you do it every week? Not necessarily. No. But it does say at some point, I understand I'm going to probably integrate these realms for intimacy and for access and for power. And I'm okay with that. It's not going to violate my identity as a child of God who's received all things freely. It's built on those things. But it's certainly a place where I'm going to move into and most spiritual men and women in the scriptures begin to do that. So number two, Jesus brings up the issue of motives. Check your motives unto the Lord. Make sure it's unto God, not to men. We can jack ourselves up on fasting because we're trying to do it to get appearances with our friends or family or whatever's around us to really think we're spiritual. And if you do that, guess what? They're going to really think you're spiritual. And you'll have your reward. <laughs> but you know what? You'll probably be at some level satisfied with that, but you're not going to get the nitty-gritty of what the fasting's all about. So you want to make sure I'm doing this on the men. And that's why he says, what, what happens when you fix your hair and um, get yourself, you look nice. People aren't suspecting at all that you're fasting. They just think you're going about a normal life. That's awesome. Keep it in hiddenness. You know, if someone asks you directly, don't lie to them. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and don't make it awkward if you're fasting and all stuff around it. But at the same point, make it so it's about God because he sees. And that's the third point here. Be confident that your father sees what you're doing and will reward it. And how does he reward this? Sometimes it's by some external blessing that might come your way. He sees, oh, I just want to bless you. But typically it's what you're seeking him on. He's going to bring a breakthrough on. He sees it. So he's going to reward you. That's the reward you desire. If I'm asking God for like a car and he comes around and he gives me like a BB gun, I'd be like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you know, that's awesome. But uh, I kind of was wanting a car. You know, my reward's not the BB gun. You know, <laughs> so look at the reward. But you'll know what it is, and he'll know what it is. And so that's what's in your heart when you're fasting. Being confident, he sees you. So it's not a vain work. And the enemy will challenge you as you begin to fast. That it's not doing anything but making you hungry and miserable. Especially if he's trying to pull your flesh and out of the spiritual discipline. So remember, he sees it, and he will reward it. So Jesus. After he has an encounter in the baptism at the Jordan, the first thing, y'all remember what the heavenly voice said to God, to Jesus at the Jordan? This is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. So look what happens in our amazing immersion, and the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus and remains. But immediately after that, it says this, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who affirmed that publicly on his life, identity and presence, he then led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. What? That doesn't seem very fun, right? And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterward hungered. And that's typically where your testing is. It's going to come right around the end. There's kind of a pattern to fast when you do it. And the tempter came and said unto him, 
thou art the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Because all you really want is to eat food naturally. And you can do it. Use your power to get the food naturally to satisfy you. But he answered, Jesus answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. That's not a super discipline call. It's a spiritual truth. It's an eternal truth. But man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. My sustenance does not come by physical means. I'm a spiritual being in Christ. And whatever he says is where I'm looking for my provision. In the spirit of Jesus, in the spirit of God. It's not because I can make this bread and feed myself. That's a temporary fix. It's not an eternal reality for me. Um, a minister, an evangelist in India once told me, he said, it's not good just to know it is written. And I'll try it for a little Indian accent. It's like, it is not good to know it is written. <laughs> it must, you must say it is also written. Okay? <laughs> That's what Jesus is doing. Because the devil's throwing out scriptures in his fast. All right? How many times do we get, get that? But Jesus said, it is also written. Here's some context. No way. So what Jesus pulled on from there as a side note is he pulled that out of Deuteronomy where Jesus actually, or God fed the children of Israel with the bread of heaven, right? Remember that? The manna came down. And so they didn't have food out in the wilderness. There was nothing. And so they turned to God and God said, I'll make provision. And God brought provision. So again, God was teaching them, anchor on me, not on your provisional circumstance. That's another lesson in itself. But we live, and this is kind of a key. Um, this is now feasting, not fasting. Um, this will shift you as you begin to fast. And say you're doing like a three or four day maybe a week-long juice fast or vegetable fast, um, and uh, you feel kind of weak, um, and you're like, man, I really enjoy when I'm eating. There's a lot of sacrifice you make beyond just not eating food. You get the fellowship and the community and the kind of time out to go eat. But remember this thing, and a lot of, I think, health professionals that kind of put this in your heart to keep you healthy, but it says this, we eat to live and not live to eat. So feast on his will and calling in your life. So this is what Jesus said in John chapter 4, or Talking about Jesus, yeah, about his food. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Why would they have to say that to Jesus? Probably because he was fasting and looked probably pretty hungry. But Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Again, he's going back to his spiritual sustenance. This is way bigger than me eating my burger every day and feeling like I can go for it again. You know, this is about true meat, true food, true drink. I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Completely. But Jesus said to them, my food, again, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. In fact, that's so much stronger in my spiritual power, in my, in my heart, in my drive, than it is to, okay, yeah, you're right. We haven't eaten. We should go find a great place to eat right now, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But he's seeing the power of God operating, not off hamburgers, but off of a, a commitment, a desire to fill the word of God. Um, and so there's food there. So feasting, not fasting. And when you go into fast, again, you make it about feasting on Jesus. Somebody said this is like, how do you fast so much? You get so much breakthrough. He's like, well, because I don't focus on the sacrifice. As soon as I focus on the opportunity, not a pursue. And so I don't even call it fasting. I call it feasting. Because my mindset's not about withdrawal in these seasons. It's about feasting and getting close to God. It's access and more bountiful provision spiritually. When you get your mindset there, you're going to have amazing ability and freedom to really get uh, full of the Spirit. Um, so then, this is another one you all are familiar with, the fasting destroys unbelief. And this is a time when Jesus casts out a devil out of a young boy. And the disciples were doing it. They'd already been commissioned, hands laid on them, like you guys will be doing. Um, maybe not today, but tomorrow maybe. But um, there is a opportunity where this boy was just completely bound by a demonic presence. And you know, just the Word of God alone and having Bible knowledge wasn't getting it done. Even just being in the camp and following Jesus wasn't getting it done. So they're praying for him, and Jesus ultimately had to come back, and they failed in getting this devil out of his kid. So then the disciples came to Jesus privately, and Jesus had to rebuke them, and then he came in and cast that devil out. So they came to Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we drive it out? Why couldn't we deal with this issue in our life? How come this thing that was binding the situation that we know you want us to deal with, how come it wasn't moving out? It should have just moved out because you desired it to be gone. And nope. And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, what's a devil? You'll say to the mountain over here, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. So the issue is about your faith. And so he goes in to say this last kicker verse, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So the point there is that faith can be dealt with through your prayer and fasting. Why? Because you feel the Spirit. You're getting close to God. You're getting confident. 
You're getting caught, you're getting anointing on the word. Um, all right, next one here. So finally, let's talk about some fasting and praying. And I'm just trying to load some scriptures for you guys to kind of get some different angles on this whole fasting topic. And then we're going to bring it back down to some practical application. But here, now in the church is Acts 13, 1 and 3. And I want you to see this operating. And in the prayer room, I think we have the, we're the most likely candidate to have prayer and fasting operating. And it wasn't just because sometimes there's an issue or whatever, but sometimes it's a great waiting posture as you're intentionally waiting on the Lord. You're intentionally pursuing God. And this is Acts 13. Paul's there among prophets and teachers, and they're in a place of prayer and fasting. Since I was now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, so ministering to the Lord and fasting, Anna did that in the temple, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So it's amazing to me that's one thing, they're already in posture prayer and fasting, and then the Holy Spirit speaks. It's like invites a directive. How many of you need a directive in your life? How many of you need some sort of a direction? Come on, we all do. We all need to hear it. And it didn't seem like in this situation it came apart from these realities happening. And they were willing to do it. And again, going back with Paul, remember what he had learned? For in my, in my weakness, I've learned to be strong. So he's saying, I need to get a little, maybe a little more broken. I'm a little bit more dependent on God. Maybe I'm too, too full of myself right now. And so fasting became a means of emptying of self to be dependent on God. And then God shows up for him. So having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. So breakthroughs, some of your breakthroughs connect, I believe, in this season with your ability to begin letting God teach you how to pray and fast. And so let him do that. And when you hear the voice of the Lord, pray and fast some more. And that's really, they've really gotten in the zone at that point. Usually we pray and fast, God speaks, we're out of there. <laughs> you know? But amazing to have such a value for this place that God speaks and you, it becomes a part of your life. We later learn in Corinthians about Paul saying, I've been in many trials, fasting is often. If you want apostolic power, you want to move an apostolic calling, prophetic calling, fasting will always be there. It's just going to be there. And you're going to learn how to do it and steward it in the right motives without betraying identity and all those things. All right, so here's some fast, um, fasting practical. Number one, just do it. You know, we get so many like excuses for not. Well, I work hard every single day. I'm like, okay, then fast bubble gum. I mean, you know, something, uh, I, I, I went on a 40-day uh, juice fast, actually, um, back in uh, when I was working in California. And I thought, my first thought was like, how many times do I do this? when I'm like working every single day and I've got to be sharp and focused and doing all this stuff. And um, I'm like, well, I, I don't know. I'm just going to have to trust God. But this is something the Lord put on my heart to do. Okay. okay. Good. Well, that'd be like a forced fast. <laughs> but at the same point, you did it. Yeah, glad you brought that up because that's something, there's mysteries in fasting. Unless you do it, you won't figure them out. You won't experience them. But fasting will indeed give you a hardcore ability to think and process. I've been in juice fast or whatever where it's hard the first few days, but then you get in the zone is what I call it. And I can read books like fast and retain information. Bam, bam. When I pray, I feel anointing very strongly. I feel the tangible presence of God. I feel fire. Things are moving. And I'm not doing them any differently than my natural man. I'm just doing them with an atmosphere of fasting attached to my life. And you guys will too, and you need to taste it. That's why some of these realms, until you do it, you're not going to get activated or understand it. It'll kind of be theory and all this stuff, and yeah, maybe one day, but you've got to just allow yourself to go there at some point. But um, yeah, so you just got to do it. And, and I just, um, I'd done a couple ramp up fasts for that one fast, but it was amazing. I was walking around uh, in the middle of that fast, and we were at Safeway, which is kind of like a Publix or Kroger in California, and I was on aisle, I can't remember which aisle I was. <laughs> it was like the cereal aisle or something usually our go-to aisle. <laughs> and um, I just felt the prophetic anointing come all over me. And I'm like, Rachel, come here right now. She's like, huh? <laughs> come here, i got to pray for you. I've got to let this out. <laughs> and so it was like, I forgot all the different things we were prophesying that <laughs> Rachel remembered. Okay. And the health stuff began happening. 
Yeah, I remember all those different things. So it was funny because it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to really try this now. It's like it came over me. And I always already had a grid for a theology for like cool prophecy and all that stuff. I already liked it, loved it, felt that. But this is where it began to overtake me. And so even with um, the disciples in Acts chapter 5, it was something where they're moving and anointing, but then the shadow of God's presence would come over them. So the Holy Spirit in and upon, and that's what you unlock in the past. It's really powerful. But that was amazing. It spoke to me. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, so what you want to do is like choose a day or a meal. Maybe this week if you're so bold to do it, you know, wherever you're at. And just begin to take that meal time, say, I'm not going to eat, or I'm going to have just veggies, and I'm not going to have sweets or meats. That's kind of a great one. I love that one. It's called what I call the Daniel Fast. The Daniel Fast might be a little more technical than that, but just no meats or sweets. But what already what that does, it begins to put you in a zone of life is different. I'm not just able to order anything I want off every menu. That in itself releases a power and a grace in a mysterious way. It really does. And then what you find, too, in these places is you are becoming more weak by the flesh, but your spirit's staying strong and getting stronger. I find myself more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And so instead of just fasting, because that's good, I should have that in my, or my like, stuff of ministry bag of stuff I do, I so appreciate fasting that I'll line it up oftentimes in ministry. If I'm going to ministry time, I'll fast before that, or on a ministry day, I'll be fasting. Why? Not so I can say I've done it, but because of the sensitivity that comes my way. I feel anointing. I can flow the Spirit. I'm leaning more on His presence than on, okay, great, I feel good and I'm ready to do this. <laughs> you know? All right, um, so then, so you just choose a day or time. I mean, it's rare that you'll ever feel like the Holy Spirit saying, okay, go out, and today I'm going to take you fast. You're going to love it. <laughs> you know, you know what would, if, if He did say that, what would that feel like? You know, Maybe, I think it's not, as we try to make it so technical that we never hear God lead us to a fast. But I think it's more of like, I just have a desire kind of come over me to, to do this. And I'm just going to follow the Lord in it. And I feel like I can do it. I've had a grace with that, um, where I just feel that sometimes. And other times I just have to go for it. I'm just going to do it, Lord, please help me. You know? So just choose a day or time and go for it. Number two, there's several kinds of fast. So choose what works best for you. Um, the gentleman I knew who did 40 days of uh, water fast only, drinking only water, he almost died a couple times. He had to do this seven times in his life. He was a missionary in Israel. And uh, he, I mean, it was a pretty crazy. He was the first one to challenge me to the Bible fast. I'm like, okay, cool. Like two weeks, like juice or eating potatoes only or what? It's like no water, 40 days. I'm like, not never gonna do that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this guy's great, and he is very unusual. He's awesome, but again, he's a man of like passions. We're talking about Elijah last week. That does this, and he had a breakthrough, and God moved his whole calling after seven of those time frames. So I want you, I say that only to give you guys grid that it's not impossible to fast. It's not impossible to do some extreme stuff if God leads you to do it. You just need to make sure you check with your doctor, all that stuff. I have to say that just to, you guys are wise, be wise, you know, let people around you know that they can support you. But anyway, those if that can be done, then you can do simple stuff. You know, it's a lot easier, but you still feel it, and um, you'll feel a, a grace supernaturally, no matter what level of fasting. It's still a sacrifice. God honors sacrifice. Um, so this gentleman who did the 40-day fast, yes, I did say this, he actually, um, the Lord spoke to him audibly and said, switch to juice, like about six years ago. And so he does extend fast with juice. And so I'm like, thank God, because this guy's always challenging me, just knowing he existed, you know, running around in Jerusalem somewhere fasting like Elijah or something like, ah. So <laughs> I felt challenged, very challenged. Like, you're awesome. So when it came to chance to do like a 40-day juice fast, no problem, <laughs> you know. Um, and it still had its challenge that at the end you feel kind of cold and you're tired of just eating kind of nothing that has flavor or something and substance and pot. But when you get it back, it's great. But anyway, God really meets you and honors you. And the reason I felt led on that one was because I was turning 30. And I felt the Lord say, I want to work the vertical beam in your life. And I want some sort of dedication and consecration toward that. And the vertical beam is basically your love for God. And that this gets really tight on, tightened up. And Jesus' his ministry began at 30. David's ministry began at 30. And so it started at midnight on my 30th birthday. I'm beginning that fast. So the Lord sustained me and taught me through those things on that fast. It was really amazing. I give him the glory for helping with that. Um, okay, so the next one um, is feed your spiritual life, not as much about neglect of the body as pursuit of Jesus. And so if you don't have that framework in your mind entering the fast, again, it can get too challenging and you'll overwhelm yourself and you'll probably end up failing <laughs> or just kind of checking out and getting food. And that's okay. You know, God is so gracious with us as we're learning to do these things. He's very merciful in all of us. But at some point, you want to learn to really maintain your fast if you've committed something to God and, and honor your vow, so to speak. Okay. But um, 
as you do that, uh, you begin to say, okay, I'm hungry, and that's just my reminder to get in the presence of God. You know what I mean? I took a three-day uh, water fast once, and that was horrible. <laughs> I don't recommend it to anybody. God does it. But what happened is I didn't back off coffee. So here's a practical back off some stuff, like caffeine and things, because you're going into cold turkey on just anything. And it hurt my kidney so bad, my legs were burning. But what was interesting is that um, when I get into worship and just start praising God, it all lifts just like and the presence of God just healed me. And I was like, amazing. And then as soon as I'd kind of wane and go back in after life, I'd feel it again. And like, I don't know all that was teaching me, but it was amazing that the presence of God can do. And when you're full and you have no pain, you don't really realize that. You just kind of enjoy the presence of God. But it brought such freedom and worship and power even when I was hurting. So um, that's just a key. Back off coffee, go to decaf for a while, maybe decrease it before you go on extended fast. It will really help you. Um, all right. And then... Next one here. Yeah, so the pursuit of Jesus. Get in the Word a lot. Let the Word strengthen you. Be the time to recalibrate your grid, your inner grid with the Word of God and the presence of God. So you're going to get really blessed. And then be consistent and diligent on whatever it is He's led you in the fast for. So um, we'll get into more about that in point number five. So number four, you need to ask yourself, okay, so fasting is great. What for? I mean, just to fast or what? Well, I need to ask you a question. Do you need a breakthrough somewhere in your life? Where's the obstacle in your life right now? Where's the block? Where's the indecision point, the, the, the frustration, the burden? That's the perfect place to start. Everybody, I, I think we're always going to have something. Even Paul, who had an abundance of revelations and things, was granted a messenger from Satan, okay? So that he learned not to boast in his flesh. But that gets him, gets him weak so he could be strong. God's grace was sufficient. So look for that and say, you know what? Okay, maybe it's a directive. Maybe it's a... I'm trying to break into a, maybe a certain gifting, spiritual gifting that I've been desiring for. Maybe it's a spouse, you know. I'm really believing for a spouse to come. And um, so let that take in that secret place. Let that burden give you the power and the ability to sustain that fast. And it really helps. I'm telling you, it really helps. If you're just going for fasting for no, for no particular reason. You don't have the motivation sometimes on. Okay, number five. Um, again, fast for someone or something. Sometimes you'll need to shift into taking a burden of an individual in your life. You know, we talked about that uh, a few weeks ago, about taking others with you in your journey. You know, you can get a breakthrough and be on the top of the mountain, or you can be on a breakthrough on top of the mountain, you've got like 10 people with you. That's what Jesus did. You know, he took them with you, and he had a heart that was others oriented. So when you go into fashion realms for others, I'm going to share a dream that happened to me and put me on a fast for my brother, um, as I was starting to learn these disciplines. Um, and it really helped me sustain and gave me the fire to actually do it and keep sticking with it until breakthrough happened. So what happened is about, I was in college, I forget what year it was, but I had this dream where um, I saw my brother. <laughs> he almost died. But he was living in Oregon at the time, and uh, I saw him in several scenes inside a house, and he was being led around by some girl. And um, he was really down, he was really weak, he looked deathly and all that stuff in the dream. And then I see him get taken to a bathtub in water. And he's just going through what looked like withdrawal or some sort of drug-induced kind of symptoms that just mess your body up when you're giving yourself heroin, things like that, from out of the heroin. And then he got up from that scene, moved to another room, and he was being led by the hand. And I remember this vision in the dream. He turned back, and I was just watching him. And he turned back, and he looked at me like this. He said, and I woke up just with tears, just rolling through my, my body and just crying. And um, I didn't know, I was so freaked out by that. But I said, Lord, what do I do? And I just prayed and prayed it off. And I don't, I don't know how to help my brother. I don't even know this is happening. And so that next day I called my dad and I'm like, yeah, and your brother just got arrested. He had overdosed on heroin and it got really nasty. And we really need to be praying for him. And so I'm like, okay, I, I guess that was totally happening. And um, so I said, Lord, what do I do? And I felt what came to my heart, hearing by faith, right? I didn't get taken to a head heavenly vision and be told this it just was something in my faith and my heart to do and it was to begin to fast every single day on his birthday he was born September 17th 1967 um, so September 17th every month until a breakthrough I did a complete fast for his life until there was some sort of sign that he got saved and delivered and so that gave me a burden because I'd remember it and I would do in my fasting I'd pull away and I wouldn't always have like okay I have 15 things I'm going to pray through for my brother Sometimes it's like, Lord, I remember my brother today, and I just tell the Lord all the things that my brother did to me and what he means to me. 
him. Please have mercy on him. Save him. And in that place, God met me, and the fasting gave me the grace to break in his presence. I was already feeling weak, and I could go in a real sweet place of intercession. And to God's glory, about six months or seven months later, um, I got a phone call from my father, and he said, I just received Christ. And I felt the spirit witness in my heart when he said that, because he's had some like, oh yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus now moments, and I'm like, no, <laughs> it just sounded good. But I heard that. I felt I'm like, say it again. And my dad's like, yeah, he just received Christ. He got into a Bible study in, in the jail that he's in and received the Lord. And it's felt the Spirit all over me. I'm like, praise God. So, um, anyway, that's what's happening. What's, so, that's what's at stake, too, when you begin to fast and pray. You can begin to contend for people to break through. And I want you guys to be able to experience that. But first of all, you may need to do some fasting just for yourself, and just to get in the place with God that you're believing for and contending for. God will meet you there. And I want to be able to help you guys as we are like going into those places to give you instruction and grid for it. Um, unless you make it happen and you own it as a value statement, something that's a personal grid I want to do, I mean, embrace, it probably is never going to happen. No one will ever tell you to go fast. This is something personal with the Lord. Um, but I guarantee you there's results in it. And Jesus, before he moved in a lot of power, he did one miracle. But after the 40 days of fasting, when he came down with great power, great manifestation. Some of you guys are about to move into some great power manifestation, but God wants to take you into the testings fast. So we encourage you for that as well. Um, otherwise, he'll stay at a certain level. All right. Um, any questions on it? I just feel like opening that for a moment. We're never going to talk about How many times are you going to talk about fasting? <laughs> no. Okay, come on. Yeah, throw it out. Okay, great question. Yeah. No. <laughs> exactly. No, it's a really great question. Um, fasting, usually you want to set it as a pre predetermined time frame. Um, I, I just, I usually have an idea of what it is. I might go through like different fasting cycles. I've been doing a little bit of fasting this summer um, for specific things coming in the fall. And so I've kind of felt like every time I kind of get this little pattern in my spirit of what that will look like. And like my fasting has been recently, like kind of through the week, and on the weekend I break. And I just enjoy food and my family all stuff, but then as the week comes on again, until I get to these cycles, I'm just fasting. Um, but when it's done, it's done. Also, you'll feel a real burden lift, and you'll feel like, if I keep going, I'm not really getting much from it spiritually. I feel kind of done. I feel like it's tapped out, and that's just being sensitive to the Spirit in you. Um, so, yeah, so that's good. There's also biblical dates and time frames. Three days, it tends to be good. You see that a lot. Uh, seven days a week. Um, you're going to be fast for a year on something. You know, it's not necessarily like a food like that per se, but you can, I mean, you could, but uh, like coffee. Um, one of the weirdest fasts I ever did was like a 40-day fast on warm water in my shower. I'm like, I did not just hear the Holy Spirit say that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, no. Yes. <laughs> I just couldn't imagine. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And like, I, I felt what the Spirit was saying is like, I'm dealing with, with the lukewarmness in your culture in California. And you need to get in that shower, and on the 40th day, when you're done, the 41st day, you crank it up as hot as you want it. He's like, but you need to feel what I feel in terms of this culture being so stale toward me. And so I did, and I kind of got used to it. It was kind of like this, and also, but man, when I turn it back up, I'm like, oh my God, no wonder you love when we're on fire for you. <laughs> you know, feels great, but it was an interesting fast, nonetheless, really well. Other ones have been coffee. I challenged one of our students about five years ago. This guy was like amazing. I love this guy, but he, all he could tell you was stuff he was hearing on podcasts. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I love it, but it's none of your revelation. You know, What are you getting from God in the scriptures? What's he saying to you that I've not heard before? Because God wants to speak to you as much as he wants to talk to these guys that are awesome. We love them. But I need to hear what he's saying to you. So he's like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. So I'm like, I'm, and it just came to my spirit. I'm like, okay, brother, I'm going to challenge you personally to take a pod fast. I don't want to hear about your podcast anymore. I want you to take a pod fast and get in the Lord. And instead of listening, I want you to get in the Bible and pray and ask God to show you things. And then I want you to come tell me those things. He's like, wow, I never thought about that. He's like, I'll do that. All right, I'll do that. He came back a week later, dropping all kinds of stuff. I'm like, dude, that's blowing my mind. Yeah, that is amazing. I've never heard that before. He's like, yeah. And so he got this fire. So the fast for him was kind of different. It was just to kind of get his own spiritual life in order. You've got to get your own voice. So some of you, it's like, man, I can listen, 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 but I need to get, God wants to speak to you and break it out. That's how those guys did it. So, um, so that was one unusual fast, but it worked for him. It was really great. Chris? Wow. 
Why do you, what, what comes to your mind? I mean, obviously. Yeah, I, what I challenge for you is to re-examine how you're fasting um, and time frames maybe. So instead of it being like, okay, I've got to go and do like a juice fast for five days just to make it count. You know, if, if you really feel that, go for it. You'll have the faith for it. That's kind of what you're looking for, not for like having to open and tell you to do it, but more of like, where do I feel the grace? Where do I feel the faith to do this right now? Where, you know, where do I have that? And I'm going to match that with the time frame windows and the what. But if you don't have that, then you're just saying, I just kind of want to get a little more close to God. I want to experience a little more intimacy with the Lord, and I know it's a good thing to do then I wouldn't probably crank it up to extreme fasting unless you really felt that need. I'd make it more of like, I'm going to probably deny Facebook maybe for a week. Or I'm not going to uh, do a TV or something in my normal routine. It may not even be food. Is going to have to, I'm going to put that aside so I know it's a different time frame. And I'm going to really try to get with God during that window. And so it's not about the, the food maybe. It's about, again, you're trying to get a focus on Jesus more than your normal time frame. Um, when you're not eating, that's when I know the first thing during that big fast, or whatever. Everyone's eating. I'm not. You know, I don't have to stop during my day to go eat food. You know how much time we spend just eating food and tracking down restaurants? All of a sudden, I don't have to do that. So people go to a restaurant at work. I didn't have to. And I just go grab a coffee or whatever. I was still caught. I think I could still drink coffee or not. I forgot. But, and I'd just go sit under a tree in your work and just be with God. And it was great. And so the sacrifice, too, is the fact when people do have food, they all sit down. And you get that camaraderie, it feels warm, it's connection around food that just feels great. That's a bigger sacrifice at times than just the fact that you can. So, um, Okay, so with that time, somebody said this in college. He's like, whenever you feel a hunger pain, let that be a sign that, hey, I need to go pray some more. And so you're dealing, you're now getting off the physical man grid for how you survive into the spiritual realms. And again, it's just for a time to so remind yourself that I'm not doing this the rest of my life. Just for a time, I can endure a little bit of hardship for Jesus. I'd say planning and just discerning the grace that you have for what and what you're being called to versus trying to prove something. So it's really, again, if you keep Jesus as the focus of it and drawing near to him, a lot of the confusion will disappear. And it's like, I just really want this in my life, and I want to draw near to Jesus in this. And that'll, that'll bring so much healing and calibration to it. It'll be wonderful. Um, versus just trying to fast. Um, any other questions? Great. Oh, Chris, I love it. Um, any other questions out there? Okay, cool. Well, um, again, I want to encourage you guys to do it. We're talking about this because I believe stuff's coming in the fall and things are moving in. And the time frames we're in where we need to get our spiritual house like really strong and strengthened. And these are keys you don't have to do, but at some point you'll probably embrace them. And this is how you do it. These are some keys. It's not everything on fasting. But you watch what God does. Try it. Do it. Test something out. Let him, let him meet you there so you get your own personal faith for it. And, and then God will bless you. All right, so let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these men and women of God that love you. They're so full of your fire and your power. And Lord, you're just about to launch them into great things, Lord. I, I can't even imagine the amount of destiny sitting in this room right now, Father, and how much power you're going to unload through these individuals, God, as they grab hold of the keys of the supernatural life, of a spiritual life that's full of vitality and power. Lord, even though we feel weak naturally, Lord, that's when your grace is sufficient, God, and your power comes through. So Lord, I pray for windows. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd speak, Father, to them how and what and where and for who. Lord God, how to move in these dimensions, Lord God, and let them taste and see that you are good and that this is something that has been on the earth since probably Adam. And Lord, we just want to be a partaker of the kingdom, a minister of the gospel. We want to be faithful in season, out of season, and doing things now that we really can't do in heaven. So Lord, thank you for the opportunity to sacrifice and to draw near to you um, and to change the world with you, Father. We love you. We bless you. I pray uh, blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. All right, you guys, good. Uh, hallelujah. Yeah. Crank it up. <laughs> the sun sets free, it's windy, and there ain't no change that can hinder me.